if you could start out by telling me uh, your name and a little bit what you do. Sure. So my name is Ben Sion Klansko, and uh, I do a few things. I am um, uh, the National Director for College Outreach for Jewish Life in North America. So that's the first thing I travel the country. And I also have a website called Shabbat.com that places people for Shabbat all over the globe. And it makes, you know, help facilitates dating and, um, and all sorts of other, all sorts of other things to do with the big Shabbat each week. And um, pretty much them, they collect art. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> Um, so I'd like to talk to you specifically a little bit about uh, dating and marriage in the Orthodox community, specifically marriage. Do you think that Orthodox people um, face challenges uh, that other cultures might not? And if so, why? Uh, yeah, I mean, every culture, based on how they're brought up, face different challenges. Uh, in Orthodoxy, I would say a great challenge is that since... Uh, there's no dating outside of marriage, so it takes a little, there's a little bit of a learning curve to know how to relate the the uh, to the opposite sex. Uh, on the other hand, there's this freshness where you're not jaded, you don't have all these memories of breakups and being dumped. So it's a disadvantage and an, and an advantage at the same time. You're sort of a uh, a virgin on every level. <laughs> Right. So um, we'll talk about both sides of it, the positive and the negative. So, you know, let's start with positive. How, how did you, have you specifically seen any examples of how it manifests itself positively? Like maybe from your own experience or your kids or people you know? Oh, well, yeah. I mean, without a doubt, when, um, when, I counsel, uh, when I counsel singles or we're about to get married and just got married, sometimes I, I forget how... Uh, little experience they have, and like flabbergasted, like you don't know, like ABCs, uh, well, they pick it up right away. But it, what, it, it's, what's it's, an example of something that they might not know? I mean, just um, sometimes bedroom mannerisms are, um, are uh, have to be learned, uh, you know, the, the, the ABCs of how to court, how to woo um, each other. Um, there's this familiarity that the Orthodox community has that sort of each person has with each other, regardless of the sex. So everyone's almost a friend before you even met them. So the, the goal is that she shouldn't be your friend or you shouldn't be your friend. She should be something much more than that. So um, that magical word, it's sort of, sort of an elusive word, romance. What is romance? Is it a, a box of chocolates in a, in a red heart? Uh, Whitman chocolates used to be called. Is it all about the Whitman chocolates? Is it about our song um, or our dance, the first song that we dance together? Probably not, um, since there's not a lot of pre-marital dating or dating without marriage, so they don't have all those first, you know, the first kiss and the first song and the first. It's more very purpose-driven. Who is this person and? It's not business-like, without a doubt there's love and there's attraction, but it's very goal-oriented. So great advantages, you're, you're going to have a much lower um, degree of um, separation and divorce. Um, marriages are going to, uh, they're going to they're gonna overcome the speed bumps that sort of derail other marriages simply because you don't have memories of, you know, you know she kisses great, but certainly not as good as the other girl you just go out with her. Her bedroom mannerisms aren't the same or technique. But this is this is your first, this is your your only and, and um, everything is new, fresh and exciting and awkward. <laughs> <laughs> I like that you said awkward. Um, can you tell us some I guess we, we spoke about advantages, some clear disadvantages or or maybe awkwardness or, or difficulties that you've helped people overcome or that you've observed? Yeah, I mean, part of it is sort of like the language of love, you know, the languages of love. So, uh, like, I remember it took me years to really believe that women like chocolate. <laughs> I, I, 
I literally thought it was a cliche. Like, I finally realized, you know, they do. It's real. And now, whenever I go out, I go to the fancy, sharpful places, and my wife's eyes just light up. They also like sushi, by the way. <laughs> Not a sushi, lots and lots of chocolate. Um, sort of these kind of wooing romantic gestures, it's a disadvantage if you've never done it before. Um, and maybe just to, just to be able to express love in uh, various different ways, even, even verbally, uh, more than just, I love you. Uh, you hey. find it sort of, sort of interesting when you, um, if you've ever, around, if, if you've ever been around Orthodox couples that have been married a while, and they've learned sort of the, sort of the secular languages of love, so if you hear, if you happen to eavesdrop and you hear this very orthodox guy call his wife baby, and, and, and that stuff happens, and you're not like, you look at the guy, like, you didn't expect that to come out of his mouth, but he sort of learns the language of love, you know, baby, or, oh, you look hot. Like, you wouldn't expect this guy with a beard to take his wife the word hot. Um, but eventually, they learn that. Where do you think they learn it from? Who teaches them? I don't know. You know, they sneak a few books in the library. <laughs> they ask their friends, they ask the rabbi. The rabbis know. So, are the rabbis telling them things like that? Are the rabbis advising yeah. them like that? The rabbis do. The rabbis are very realistic. Um, they're just a point of reference. So, the rabbis will tell the the guy or girl before they get married. You know, you may want to do this. This is what's called foreplay. Step one, step two, or foreplay. And, um, it's all so theoretical, and you have to sort of live it. And they haven't been doing it since they were 15 or 16. It's, it's new. So in a way, it's, it's sort of cute. It's, it's, it's sweet. It's sweet because it's real. And um, it didn't begin when you were immature. And already when you're mature, so when you call someone honey, it's not a play. You're not, you're not trying to be the, a player. But, you know... She's my honey. He's my honey. He's my baby. So um, it's sort of. You know, I remember the, there was a, a movie many years ago about this Amish guy who gets out of Amish town and ends up sort of learning all these things in rapid fire fashion. And it was so sweet in a way how he was able to say things that people sort of throw out with, uh, uh, you know, without, you know, very casually, without thinking. And it's so sweet coming from someone who's so sincere and so loving. So very nice. There's an innocence, a real innocence. Very nice. And it sounds like maybe both parties, or maybe especially the woman, doesn't even know to demand certain things like that you might know about in society. Like you should be calling me honey all the time. She's just is that right? Right. A lot of the stigmas and the hangups that secular society has, the Orthodox world doesn't have, because um, one, one, of, one, of the, one of the keys to uh, living a Torah lifestyle, Orthodox too, is to minimize pettiness, and things that are, are not important, or in Hebrew would say not chashu, it's not chashu, it's not important, so the, the world gets really hung up, what kind of flowers did she send, were there roses, were there 12, were there 6, were they in a vase, that there was a note that accompanied that. Was there a ribbon? What color was the ribbon? Was it pink? Is that breast cancer awareness? Was it yellow? <laughs> what exactly? Like all of these secret signs and symbols. There are flowers! Thank you, I love you. And don't give me flowers. She'll say, give me chocolate. <laughs> and that's, a, that's so true. You can't make flowers, you know? Yeah, I remember personally, I remember uh, when we were engaged, my husband and my, you know, fiance at the time, picked a flower. It, it was basically like a weed, like a dandelion <laughs> from the grass, and he gave it to me, and it was just such a thrill. Like, I, uh, I couldn't believe what was happening. <laughs> you know, because it's the, it's the thought that counts. At the end of the day, you know, um, actually, there's one more left. We'll just get a little intellectual. You know, there comes a point where you have to stop testing your spouse. Start trusting that your spouse loves you. And one of the hangups of society is you're always being tested. You forgot my birthday, you didn't, you know, last minute anniversary, you didn't this, you didn't that. It's a proof that your love is not revealed. Everything is a test. Within Orthodox Judaism, you're not always tested, right? You can 
improve your love and then begin the game. Right? You can't begin the game of life while you're always, you know, doing testing one, two, three, four. Do you love me? I don't hear loud enough. You didn't say it when we had this conversation, right? So that must mean Patty, Patty, give me chocolate. Um, <laughs> give me money. Right? Money to buy a label the cleaning lady. That's all I want. That's what we want. So do you think Jewish people are a little more practical. You gave me money to pay for the cleaning lady, so I'm happy. Yeah, yeah, yeah much, much more. I mean, you know, it's hard to generalize, obviously. Um, and some, uh, you know, there is a concept of the sentiment and the effort and the love, but that that doesn't have to show on the credit card. It could be writing a poem on a on a American Greetings card and a Hallmark card. That does the same thing. And um, I had brother-in-laws who used to make arts and crafts. It was the cutest thing. Here are these Shiva Talmudic students. Uh, they're rabbis, and they're there with the Elmer's glue and the little scissors, and they're cutting out little hearts. And I'm thinking, what are you doing? You just spent an hour. And they would say, you know what? It means a lot to them. And one brother-in-law used to make a diorama, little box, shoe boxes, and make little figures of love. And it was... Innocent and cute, and it's so unexpected. Probably, if someone would see maybe a rabbi with a long beard and a black coat cutting out little paper hearts, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. So it sounds like there's there's a lot more maybe true love, maybe even romance than an outsider would think when he sees orthodox marriages. I believe so. I, I believe when an outsider looks at the insider, they're looking at it through the secular eyes of testing one, two, three, four. And if they see something, oh no, the guy walked ahead of the lady, or he didn't do this, or she didn't do that, that means that they look down at each other, degrade each other, and, and that's so silly because they're just looking through the eyes of, I don't trust, so prove it, prove it, prove it. It's proven in so many ways, uh, so many different ways. Um, you know, there are a lot of women, especially in the Orthodox world, who the way the husband proves that he loves her is if when he comes home and he spent time with the kids and so on, if he goes out to learn Torah. That actually is a proof of love. It's the wife saying, I wanted to marry a Torah scholar. You went to work, you have to go to work, but prove to me that my soulmate for eternity is still as a spiritual bent and still still a spirituality. That that shows me that you love me. That's a concept that's so out there in left field that you can't even describe it. That's a, you know, that's building the house. That's spirituality. That's that's love. Very nice. Um, now I want to ask you a little bit about some of the harder things, about some of the challenges. You have two people, maybe they dated for a month or so, maybe now it's three months later and, and they're living together. Talk to me a little bit in terms of the issues that they face, not the rosy stuff, but, but really what are some very prominent challenges. And also, just to give you some ideas, um, how they manage in terms of personality differences, maybe money issues, maybe in-laws. Like, how do two almost total strangers work it out, and what's hard for them? Good, good. I mean, the, the, in a orthodoxy, there are some of the same issues that every marriage has. Um, respect, listening, understanding, feedback, and what... One of the things that sort of make it more difficult is, uh, number one, there are periods in the month where the husband and wife uh, aren't intimate, they're not together, they don't touch. It's the eventual period during that, that time. So all of the shortcuts that the secular world has where if somebody's feeling insecure or shaken, you can draw the person close and you give them a hug and a kiss and say, it's okay, I'm sorry. Right? Th those, uh, those physical manifestations of affection, uh, you can't use them during almost half of the month. So what that really means is you have to become a developed person very quickly. You have to learn how to uh, convey remorse and convey respect and love and understanding purely on an um, interpersonal basis without the shortcut of touch. And, and, and we know touch is incredibly powerful. So, for example, 
if some if one of the uh, one of the couples gets annoyed or angry at each other, um, so what what does one do? So within Judaism, there is a concept of you can't get so angry. You can't get. You're not allowed. Uh, you know, I'll give you an example for myself. I'm married now almost 26 years. I've never raised my voice to my wife. In 26 years, she's never. My, my kids never heard me scream. And we have rules. And one of the reasons that we have rules, we set rules in our marriage. Our first year, we call them the Ten Commandments of Marriage. And those ten are sacrosanct. We don't touch them. Um, we're, we're, I'm not sarcastic. Neither of us are sarcastic. One of the rules are don't blame. No blame. And, if, and without those rules, so then within Judaism, you know, we're a, a, we're a, uh, a belief that does uh, agree with personal responsibility, and that can make it difficult. Personal responsibility, uh, well, when you're married to somebody who uh, perhaps messes up, not perhaps, but does because they're a human being, so that personal responsibility and those obligations can kick in, and you know, you can become the teacher, that stern, authoritative figure that is upset or disappointed, and you have to say no. You know, my wife or my husband is not my student. Um, they're, they, they need to know that I support them, even when they mess up, and even when they get fired, or, or even when they burn the roast, or whatever it is. I love them, and it's sort of like pushing that concept of personal responsibility aside, and saying that our love is more important than the, the mess up. And then that, that's something that, that, that really, is, so I think it's a little more difficult within the religious community, just overcoming uh, those kind of, uh, that kind of a tightness and just letting loose. Uh, you know, maybe part of that is just in general, we live very purposeful and meaningful lives. Uh, within the secular world, there, you know, there's a concept of let's drink a few martinis and let loose and go nuts and let our hair down. And, and uh, that's a little bit tough. In a uh, in a uh, religious union where people are not used to letting their guard down, and I mean, eventually they do, and uh, eventually they learn to trust that the other person is not going to judge them. And again, that that's part of the issue. You know, you because we live purposeful lives, and we we try to make sure that each thing we do is is full of meaning and and, and is there to to allow us to grow. Um, we're afraid if I act a certain way, or for example, uh, if my wife makes me suffer and I'm not thrilled with that supper, am I going to say something? Well, maybe I won't because maybe I'll sound petty. What if I like a steak? What if, what if, I, like, what if I like a steak with, with lots of mashed potatoes and lots of gravy? And will she, will she look at me and say, wow, this guy's so material. Right? And I have to trust that my spouse will understand that I'm a human being. Yeah, I mean, the, you know, in a, in a bedroom is called the Holy of Holies. It's the, it's the most sanctity. That's where life is created. And um, in order to be real, you want to be able to uh, be goofy and be inappropriate. And, um, you know, all those things that, that couples uh, want to be uh, just to, just to, to be funny and to set the mood and, you know, be a little sexy. And you want to be able to feel confident that you could then leave the bedroom and put on your spiritual cap and be devout and be a person of growth and not be judged by your inappropriateness uh, in the bedroom. And that's, that's really like going from hot to cold. So, you know, I think the world struggles with this. So if a person is absolutely goofy and ridiculous and, inappropriate imagine they may just take that with them and that becomes their persona we don't have that luxury nor do we want it we don't want that we want to be looked at as serious thinking devout purposeful people but we want to come in the bedroom and be ridiculous and inappropriate and just loosey-goosey and, and not be judged and that's something that a young couple really could struggle with but they, they find their way they push the envelope each day a little bit more.
<laughs> right, I was going to say how, especially to a secular person, it must seem very wondrous. How do two people who have never touched each other before or touched anyone before all of a sudden go and, you know, nine months later they're having a baby? How, how do they figure that out? So I'll tell you what my father told me. My father gave me a beautiful piece of advice. He said, on the first night when you're married, say the following verse from the Torah. He said, I said it, and it helped my marriage. He said, you should say it'll help you. And I actually did it, it helped a lot, and I conveyed it to other people. It says in Genesis, by Yeda Adam Ishta, and Adam knew his wife. And what does that mean to know somebody? So the biblical knowing, of course, is involves uh, intercourse, sexuality, but it's more than just the D, but it's getting to know them. It's going getting to know their curves. It's getting to know their their sensitive spots on their body. That's, that's knowing. That's why it's called in the Bible knowing. And knowing means you're supposed to have the knowledge of who that person is physically. And therefore, you know, when my first night when we got married, I said, the Torah says, Adam met Eve and you have to know her. I'd like to get to know you. What are you about? And and very gently I was able to um, approach my wife and get to know her and she felt comfortable and she told me that that one idea really helped her feel comfortable that first night. That's cool. That's very nice. That's <laughs> what do do couples have a recourse if they're struggling with this? Like, who would be someone they would talk to if if they didn't get that piece of advice and they're not making it? Um, I mean, the, the, the I always uh, I always recommend marital counseling if needed. You know, so that's you know, Judaism is very into uh, empathy. It's the you know, that, that is the key to all of Judaism. What is hateful to you, don't do to your friend. That's empathy. So when you speak to somebody who has the ability to be empathetic and understand, yes, I can understand how difficult this is. I can understand how, I can understand how tough this is perhaps how to approach it. Um, that's a very Jewish idea. Therapy is very Jewish. Um, but I think that they should be able to turn to their parents if they have a good relationship. Uh, and we don't have that stigma it's interesting in the secular world when whenever people think of their parents um, or their parents doing the deed, you hear "ew, gross," like "ew, my parents." Uh, we don't we don't we don't actually have that reaction. Uh, we don't have it because uh, we try to sort of veer away from it's all about hotness, young, nubile. You know, you know that's what it's all about that that young, fresh body. I want to get old and wrinkly, you know, ew. It's not like we understand there's a lifelong commitment, and, but something really quite beautiful. And my father was the one, of course, with uh, respect, gently and uh, with class, explained to me the ins and outs, the birds and the bees. Um, and my, I explained it to my kids. Um, but most rabbis who are good rabbis should be able to explain to their students what to expect, and um, if done right, uh, you know, there's there's no harm in in experiment. There's no harm in you know telling a couple you don't have to be experts overnight. You know, you, there's a great advantage of the first time that you've tried any position, the first time you had any experience when it comes to sexuality. The memory is going to be with this person, the one that you love, but. Uh, what a potent, powerful idea that is. Very nice, very nice. Yeah. So, in terms of other challenges, what would you consider intimacy to be the biggest challenge facing a new couple, or, or what would you say is the hardest thing? Uh, I think intimacy with within the Orthodox world um, is a challenge, without a doubt. Whether it's the biggest challenge, it would depend on the couple, but it's not a challenge that can't be overcome. It's just a much greater challenge than somebody who's been uh, in a fraternity for four years and is so, you know, is so uh, proficient at it that it's just, you know, it, this is just a mere formality. You know, it's official. It's a legitimate challenge. There are other challenges. Uh, 
Uh, yeah, what do you think is one of the biggest challenges? You know, one of the challenges is um, a guy, for example, uh, who has been going to yeshiva all of his life and has been sort of on his own, caring about himself, all of a sudden has to uh, learn how to be domesticated and, you know, pick up room, fold some laundry, call if you're going to be late, um, you know, really, really figure out what does that mean to be part of a partnership. Um, it, it's a challenge. It's a challenge. It's even a challenge for somebody who is a studious person who has been conditioned all of their life to understand and believe that every moment that is spent not studying the Torah is perhaps a waste that could be better used. All of a sudden, to be told, no, picking up that room is a holy act, and helping out is something that the Almighty wants. Uh, and uh, at times, it is a greater deed, a holier deed, and more necessary than uh, running back to Yeshiva and studying Torah. And this is a message that we actually get in Yeshiva. When a person goes to Yeshiva, one of the study periods is called night saving, which means the study period in the evening, it's a few hours of study at night, and a person in the first year of their marriage is advised to skip that. So after the afternoon period, they go home and they spend all evening with their with their spouse, at least the first year, because that's what love is. It means being there for them, playing Rummy Cube, playing Pictionary, going bowling, being chill, you know, doing things that maybe your spouse doesn't uh, inherently enjoy learning how to enjoy them. You know, if it's the wife, maybe she'll learn how to enjoy baseball or football, right? Maybe he will learn to uh, enjoy her music or her hobbies or her books. And it's not a waste of time. It's a, it's a really purposeful act of building love and relationship. Okay, now I want to ask uh, the, the dreaded two words, uh, in-laws. <laughs> what about that? What, what can you talk about two families coming together? Any, any stories about that? Any, not just advice, but, but you know, experiences that you can share? Yeah, I mean, my, my, my in-laws are just, they're so amazing. So um, I, I, I think... Have you heard any nightmare in-law stories? Or? <laughs> I, I, I learned to put the rules up right away because... I remember staying at their house right in the beginning. Um, it was like I just got married or I was engaged, and I guess my mother-in-law came in when my shirt was open and my tits were showing, and I guess my, my tits were a little bit not so clean, you know, their tits were very often underneath the shirt, and she made some sort of a comment, like, oh, you know, you could, you know, tits can be washed. I, she, she wasn't she didn't mean to be mean, but like, like oh, no, here it begins. Um, you know, some, some in-laws are just, it's humorous. This mother-in-law, she was sitting down with this son-in-law and she was serving him supper and it was right at the beginning of the marriage and it was a torturous meal because she would serve him something and he would, and she would say, you like the soup? Yeah, I like it. No, you don't like it. You don't like it. Yeah, I do. It, it needs salt, doesn't it? No, mommy, it's delicious. No, no, you're just saying it, right? No, it's cold. It's cold. I, why not? I should heat it up. No, you don't have to heat it up. No, listen, you don't have to finish it to make me feel good. No, I like it. And she's going, oh, and then came the chicken. The chicken is a crispy. And she needed so much reassurance. And he's being like, I will never get this chicken down my throat. <laughs> How do I convince her that I love it? So finally, he finished it. She says, you want more, right? So she serves him second. He doesn't want third. You don't like it, do you? Like, it's third, mom, I'm full. No, you don't like it. Next time, just say you don't like it. I'm like, and I won't serve it. You know, maybe maybe my daughter cooks better. Like, I praise you. So, you know, a lot of reassurance that you're not stealing their kid, that you're part of the family. That's why we call mother in laws, father in laws, mommy, daddy, mommy, daddy, right away, just to sort of establish that, you know, you are. You know, you're my parents, and I love you, and I'm not, I didn't take your, your daughter or son away, but I became part of your family. Um, and 
And then it won't be a nightmare. Then uh, it'll be pleasant. And the best thing is to move far away. <laughs> I love that advice. Yeah. Do you tell your students that? Just just move far away. I uh, uh, I didn't tell it to them, uh, but I, I sort of hinted to them. You may want to consider living in Israel. <laughs> now you know the real reason. Now we send them to Israel to get away from the Amor. Now we know why so many people moved to Israel. <laughs> and what about um, holidays? How to figure out? Talk about. I mean, I know personally that it's a big deal whose house you go to for which holiday. It's really interesting. Um, we have a son who it looks like tomorrow night he's going to get engaged, and oh, um, uh, God willing, we're really excited about it. Michael's house. Thank you. So the girl lives in Israel. So, you know, we, we never actually met her. So we would like her to come to America and spend face up with us, which is going to be in a few weeks. And there's going to be some negotiating going on. You know, we just take the kid and fly to America, right? Uh, but in general, our rule is we don't stand on ceremony. And we try not to be petty. And when your kid gets older, they get married. They're adults They're on their own. They uh, deserve their freedom, just like you had your freedom. And if you didn't have your freedom, you know how bad it is. So for sure, should give them their freedom, and not to, not to stand on ceremony. And you know, sometimes people don't listen to that, and they make a big deal out of it. And it's uh, as we say, it's a shanta. It's a shanta. It shouldn't be that way. So. Um, Anybody, anybody. Why, why do you think, well, oh, so first of all, first of all, Mazel Tov, I'm so happy for you. <laughs> and I can't believe you're giving us time you know, to speak to us now when, when you're having an engagement, hopefully, tomorrow night. Um, but I just have to ask about this. Does this mean your son is getting engaged to a girl you've never met, and, and you're okay with that? You know, it's funny. My daughter just asked me that question today. She said, how could you, how could you let her marry... Uh, you did yet, that's my son's name, if she's never, if, if, if you never met her. So I said, what's the problem? I said, you know, the world, very often, when we speak about trust, the world has like these certain markers, and without those markers, you can't survive. So you have to meet the girl, because that's protocol. Of course, we would love to meet the girl, and we're going next week, we're flying to Israel. But the real question is, do we doubt that this girl is an awesome girl? We don't, because we did the research. We did enough phone calls. We spoke to enough people. We don't doubt it. Do we doubt that our son loves her? No. We know our son many years. We know he loves her. So what, what's the purpose? Just to make it official, we don't stand on ceremony. The world so often uses these kind of markers in order to make something official. Of course we would like to. We would love to, obviously. So a picture of her and so on. And it sounds strange to other people, but we don't have doubts. So it's so we'll meet her next week. What are we gonna say? Well, look at her, she's not pretty enough for our son, right? She's not smart enough, her family's not good enough. That's why Jewish matchmaking involves a lot of research and we find out a lot that and because of that, we feel like we we know this girl, we're so comfortable with this girl, and uh, we we are going in with a full heart. Uh, an open, open mind and uh, full, full of gladness. Very nice. Very, very, very special. <laughs> so I guess they couldn't wait for the, the next week for you to come. That didn't uh, work. They, they could have. They could have. Uh, but I didn't want to do that to my son or to the girl. You yeah. know, they're, they're, if they're ready. So selfishly, I'm going to make them wait for a week just so I can give them the thumbs up. Okay, you're just what we knew you would be. <laughs> It's painful, right? It's painful a girl to know that she's ready to get engaged, but she's got to keep it secret for a week. That's horrible. So, uh, very uh, considerate. And and how long have they been dating? So this is this is interesting. In America, people go out for you know in the Orthodox world, you go out for about a month and a half, two months, sometimes three months, usually no less than a month, which sounds short for the sake of the world, but. Uh, because you've done research, it's really not. Um, it sounds funny, but my son met the girl last uh, Saturday night. So they met 
Saturday night. They met Sunday night. They met Wednesday night. And he's going to pop the question. He's going to pop the question on a Saturday night. So, uh, so <laughs> again, quick, quick, quick. Uh, but you know, we happen to trust our son, which which is why this situation wouldn't be difficult. Our son is a, he's an amazing boy. He's a clear thinker. Um, girls in the religious world are, are relatively uncomplicated, um, especially those who grow up with her background. Uh, just she's a giver. Uh, her classmates and her teachers and her, her friends speak the world of her. And my son, who spent whatever amount of hours getting to know her, knows he's attracted to her, sees that everything that we said is so. Um, again, it's it's not me preaching to everyone, this is the way to do it. I wouldn't recommend that. But with this son, with this girl, in this circumstance, um, again, we're not we're not concerned. Wow, what a story. What a, so I have to ask why you mentioned that you wouldn't recommend it. Why do you think most people couldn't do this? Because I know most people are, you know, more complicated. You know, most people are more complicated and... And Americans, in particular, are very complicated. Where we live in a society that analyzes and psychoanalyzes everything and everyone, and purpose and trust issues, and and uh, it's really a complicated world. Um, in the world that this girl grew up in, which is uh, in Israel, in the very religious, devout, purposeful uh, communities, where. People live and breathe kindness and consideration and love and happiness. I mean, the first thing everyone said about this girl is she is constantly the simcha, which means she is always joyous. She walks around. She doesn't walk. She floats around. People want to be around her because she's just so happy. She emanates positivity and warmth. Um, all of her life, she's just been that person of kindness and consideration and love. There were literally no red flags. And that's rare. That's rare. You know, I interview people in my job as a campus outreach rabbi. I do interviews for trips. I interview rabbis for positions. And I, my, part of my skill set is listening out, watching out for red flags. People who overshare information or use uh, words that are emotionally charged and, and all sorts of, all sorts of um, ways of sort of uncovering layers on the person. That's what I'm trained in. So when I interviewed somebody for a match, I, I, was, I was looking out for those words and they were not to be found. People were just so positive uh, through and through. Uh, we are the words lucky, home run, I wanted her for my nephew. Uh, just one thing after the next, no, no red flags. And we know our son is, is very much the same way. So uh, do you want to call it spiritual love uh, at, first, at first sight? Uh, soulmanship? Oh, that's a word I'd love to uh, coin. <laughs> soulmanship, if you're good at... I check it out. Uh, who's, who's your soulmate? You're, you got some good soulmanship going on. Very so, nice. and then there is some a level of I'm assuming amuna, like a leap of faith, right? Yeah. Yeah, that without a doubt, With, without a doubt, I mean, it is. There is a degree uh, of trepidation, not about the girl, but about the fact that the whole concept is somewhat foreign to uh, to myself, and my wife, meaning. Uh, she's Israeli, although her parents are American, so she speaks English, but it's English with an accent. Uh, she grew up in maybe a more closed, not maybe, but definitely a more closed uh, environment than, than, than my son did. Uh, there is a certain amount of trepidation, but one has to believe that uh, the Almighty is moving the chess pieces around. And uh, we've seen, it, we've seen this with the, with the first two kids where the Almighty was just simply moving them around and controlling uh, the situation. And uh, sometimes we just have to open the door and uh, let the great matchmaker in the sky do his thing. So uh, uh, we saw it with the first two kids, 
and we saw the circumstance, how we met this girl, uh, were unusual, and um, we just felt like this is something that uh, there, there seems to be a spiritual inertia that's pushing this forward. So we let, we, we, we wrote it out, we waited to see where it was going to take us and take our son, and uh, we're, we're pleased that we did. Very nice. Wow. Baruch Hashem. What, what a beautiful... Thank you so much for sharing that. This is an, an added bonus. I thought we'd talk generalities, but we, <laughs> we got to talk very specific. The very last thing I'd like to end with is a question about um, divorce, when it doesn't work. Um, is, that, is that acceptable? Um, if you can talk about that. And do you think sometimes it happens too soon or not soon enough? <laughs> So, I mean, it would, it would certainly depend on the society in the Orthodox world. Um, there is no question that divorce is viewed as a tragedy. And while it is a tragedy in all of society, but I think the rest of society uses a different word. They use the word mistake. Uh, we acknowledge that there were mistakes that may have been made. But the word that we use is tragic. Uh, it sounds the same, but it really isn't. A mistake is a mistake is you know I I, uh, I bought the wrong pair of shoes, right? I thought I was a size nine and a half, but I'm a size nine, so my soul keeps popping out. That's a mistake. That's not a tragedy. There's a difference. Tragedy means that you know this has been. Um, uh, this is this is something that is going to hurt, and people are going to be uh, scarred. They're going to be there's a certain amount of damage that you're causing. A lot of the openness and the the, the optimism in life is going to be is going to be crushed, and and that involves sadness. Uh, the Talmud says that divorce causes the the. Uh, the altar in the temple to shed tears. It's a it's a it's a very very big, very strong concept. So when divorce is needed, we're not Catholicism. Divorce can happen. Uh, it is legal. It can be done. Um, but we really really try to 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 figure out whether the divorce is occurring uh, because of petty reasons. Is is there a separation or a misunderstanding? That simply that a misunderstanding is there a lack of maturity that is bound to mature that's bound to uh, that, that, that's bound to change if you give it enough time and if we don't give enough time uh, you know we, we've robbed ourselves of something that could have been very beautiful so that's how we look at it. we look like a tragedy we look at it very often as lack of maturity and it doesn't it could be that you're in your 30s, not in your 20s, and you can still be immature. What's the definition of maturity? There's two definitions. One is uh, a lack of the a lack of awareness of the long-term consequence of actions. That's if people are immature, they don't have that, that understanding. I, if I do A, it will lead to B, it will lead to C. And the other hallmark of a lack of maturity is selfishness. I'm very selfish, but I'm very into myself like a child so that my worldview is is cut off, it's cut short, and I can't incorporate another person and their needs into my worldview. So these are things that can't be worked on. Selfishness, you can go and volunteer at a nursing home, volunteer with disabled children. You work on oneself. In Judaism, we actively work on oneself. So that would be one recommendation for a couple that is suffering from lack of maturity. And uh, when it comes to understanding uh, the, the results, the cause and effect of one's action, we try to make it clear, you know, if you get divorced, there will be some ramifications. They're going to be tough, and especially there are children. And you have to think a hundred times before saying goodbye. But if the right thing is to say goodbye, then you say it. You try to be a mensch about it. You try to be uh, proper about it. And, you know, God willing, you'll find your soulmate. And they'll find their soulmate. And they will be able to uh, pick up the pieces and build beautiful homes. 
Very nice. And what about temper? Do you think a bad temper can be controlled, or is that like just a terrible thing? Well, what I tell my students is there are two character traits that if you notice them, especially tell this to the girls, I say to them, if you see a guy with one of two character traits, run for the hills. And those two character traits are anger and honesty. If there are issues of anger, issues of honesty. Very, very tough to change. Can it be changed? Yes, it can. But the person has to be aware of it. They have to be open to changing. And they have to, you know, if they need therapy, which they probably do, they should accept it and work on themselves. Uh, but those are the two great warning signs. Anger and lack of honesty. Very nice, very nice. Okay, thank you so much for talking with me. and. By extension with us. <laughs> and wow, I'm very, I think this was so enlightening. I really appreciate it. And I'm, I'm thanking you on other people's behalf as well. <laughs> so I want to wish you a good Shabbos and um, a, a big, imminent mazel tov. <laughs>